The subject of our discussion today is a bit out of character for biblical holy days and their messages, because we aren't discussing a specific holy day per se. Rather, we are reflecting upon the period between two, and by implication, we'll have something to say about each one of them. Specifically, the period that begins after Passover, as we read it described first in Leviticus chapter 23. So let's begin with Leviticus chapter 23, verse 9, and reflect upon the extraordinary period and commandment that pertains to the count of the Omer. We read again, beginning with chapter 23, verse 9, God spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the people of Israel, and say unto them, When you are come into the land that I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring an Omer of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So, of course, inevitably, First definition here, what is an omer? An omer is a measure of grain that corresponds roughly to the amount that a person would eat over the course of the day. And what is done with this omer of the first fruits of your harvest? Note, what these fruits are has still not been identified. We'll return to that point a little bit later. And he, the priest, shall wave the Omer before God to be accepted for you on the morrow after the day of rest, which one could read Shabbat as the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. So we continue with our definitions. What is this waving? This waving is, in short, taking the offering and waving it, literally, in all of the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, and up and down. Of course, there's one additional word here that crucially demands definition, and that is, what is this Sabbath? As you may be aware, the identity of this Sabbath was a bone of contention toward the end of the Second Temple period, when there were sectarian groups that maintained that it is indeed the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week. And I think it's important for us to bear in mind certain considerations that maybe regard that interpretation as superficial. First, it is instructive for us to consider what this word Sabbath, which of course I'm rendering as day of rest means. The Hebrew Shabbat comes from the root Shvita Lishbot, which means to cease, to cease from doing work. It is of course in precisely that manner that the Sabbath day is first introduced in Genesis chapter 2 when God ceases from his creative, productive work. The reason I'm stressing this is because that means that any day of rest, any day upon which one ceases from doing work, in some sense, is indeed a Shabbat. And in context, when we consider the verses that immediately precede the ones we just read, we do indeed find that there are days of rest that come before. That is, the set of verses that immediately precedes this discussion of the Omer in Leviticus chapter 23, beginning in verse 5, concerns Passover. And in particular, we read in verses 7 and 8, in the first day, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no manner of servile work, indeed, in verse 8, we read the same with respect to the seventh day. We've discussed this elsewhere, that in the seventh day is a holy convocation. 
you shall do no manner of servile work. These two days are both, in that sense, Sabbaths. They are in the seventh day of the week, but they are Sabbaths in the sense of a day upon which work is forbidden. Now, of course, in appreciating that we just referred to both the first day and seventh day of Passover as days that are candidates for being considered Sabbaths, we still haven't clarified further which Sabbath would it be that is being identified as the day after which this wave offering from the Omer is brought. But we get some further inkling, this is perhaps the second consideration we should note in clarifying the identity of this Sabbath, when we consider what we read in the passage that immediately follows the offering of which we read at the beginning of our session. And that is, note after verses 10 and 11 and verse 14, at describing this offering that is brought on the morrow after the day of rest, we read, you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn, nor fresh ears until this self same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Now, of course, there's a very obvious question that we need to consider here, and that is, you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor fresh ears until the self same day. How long are you supposed to starve? But then in context, the answer becomes clear because Again, recall in verse 10, you shall bring an Omer of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. In other words, once you begin this new harvest, you are not permitted immediately to consume this new harvest before the harvest is eligible for your private consumption. An offering is brought of the Omer as this wave offering brought into the holy temple only then are you permitted to eat the produce of this harvest what is particularly tantalizing here is that in joshua chapter 5 for all appearances we read precisely of the fulfillment of this directive in leviticus because we read beginning in verse 10 that the people of Israel, after crossing into the western part of the land of Israel, encamped in Gilgal, and they kept the Passover offering on the 14th day of the month at evening in the plains of Jericho. Verse 11, and they did eat of the grain of the land on the morrow after the Passover, 11 cakes and parched corn in the selfsame day. In other words, Clearly, it was the first day of Passover, which is, of course, why everything they're eating is still unleavened after the seventh day. Obviously, one can eat leavened products as well. But after the first day of Passover, they observed this mandate in eating the produce that is from then on permissible just as we read in verse 14 in chapter 23 of Leviticus, which again further guides us to the realization that on the morrow after the day of rest is on the morrow of that first day of the holiday of Passover. There's an additional final consideration, third, that I'd like to share with you, and that is that as the Hebrew experts will undoubtedly discern, the manner in which this day of rest is identified is simply as Ha Shabbat, the Sabbath. Consider as one of many examples, the way the Sabbath is identified in the Ten Commandments. There it is Yom Ha Shabbat, the Sabbath day. Well, of course, when we read Yom Ha Shabbat, the Sabbath day, number one, it becomes clear we're speaking of the seventh day of the week, as opposed to the Sabbath, 
which again, we reiterate, has a looser meaning and can refer to other times when work is forbidden. But there's an additional dimension. The fact that yom, day, is omitted here invites the possibility that we may not be speaking about a day as the period of the Sabbath at all. Well, that shouldn't be at all surprising to us because after all, we recall very well, and indeed we've discussed this, that in Leviticus chapter 25, we read of a Sabbath that lasts for a whole year. In chapter 25, verse 2, speak unto the people of Israel and say unto them, when you come into the land that I give you, then shall the land rest for a Sabbath unto God. And just what is the duration of this Sabbath? The seventh year shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath unto God. What implications does this observation have with respect to the morrow of the Sabbath that has not been explicitly identified as of day length in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 11. An interesting proposal of one of the great Bible scholars of the 19th century, we've mentioned him on a number of occasions, Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch, is the Sabbath may in fact be referring to the period that concludes when this offering is brought. What period would warrant being described as a Sabbath? A period upon which, as indeed we read in verse 14, you can't consume the fruits of this harvest yet because you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor fresh ears until this selfsame day. So the harvest couldn't really begin in earnest until this offering was brought. And so, in some sense, the period up until bringing this offering is called a Sabbath. In any case, it certainly is of unequivocal support in our tradition. And remember, there was an unbroken tradition that went back to Mount Sinai when God gave Israel the Torah, that on the morrow after the Sabbath, after the day of rest, referred not to the seventh day of the week, but rather the day after Passover, the holiday that was described in the foregoing verses. And of course, once we come to this realization with respect to just what the offering is, on the one hand, we appreciate what's going on in the temple service. Of course, it should be clear to us that it doesn't really help us very much in what, for the purposes of this series, Biblical Holy Days and their messages is our primary goal. What are we supposed to make of this? While knowing what happened when the Holy Temple was standing in Jerusalem is undoubtedly of interest to many people who would like to understand what living according to the Bible was like, it's not exactly an immediate message to any of us. We don't have the temple today. So what's the message? If it would only be about the offering brought in the temple, we probably would have a problem. But that's not all that we read. Rather, on the contrary, beginning in verse 15, we return to Leviticus chapter 23, and we read, you shall number unto you. From the morrow after the day of rest, we already identified that in the foregoing discussion, from the day that you brought the Omer of the waving, seven weeks or seven Sabbaths shall there be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh week shall you number 50 days and you shall present a new meal offering unto God. And there is a description of this offering in verse 17, you shall bring out of your dwellings the two wave lobes of two-tenth parts of an ephah, which is also a measure, they shall be of fine wheat 
flour, they shall be baked with leaven for first fruits unto God. And in the continuation, we read what the priest is supposed to do with this offering in verse 20, the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before God with the two lambs. They shall be holy to God for the priest. These loaves are brought at the conclusion of this 50 day period. And at the conclusion of this period, there is also, as we read in verse 21, a holy day. You shall make proclamation on the self same day. There shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall do no manner of servile work. What is this holy day? Tantalizingly, in Leviticus chapter 23, we don't get an answer. But when we revisit the cycle of the holy days, before the nation enters into the land of Israel, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, Immediately following the description of Passover, we read in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 9, seven weeks shall you number unto you from the time the sickle is first put to the standing corn, shall you begin to number seven weeks. Same commandment of which we read in Leviticus chapter 23, of course. And what happens at the end of this period now has a name. It's even a familiar name from passages concerning the holy days that we read earlier on in the Torah. You shall make the feast of weeks, Shavuot, Pentecost, unto God your Lord, after the measure of the free will offering of your hand, which you shall give according as God your Lord blesses you. So it's at the end of this period that we come to the Feast of Weeks, having counted the seven weeks, the 50th day, the holy day of Shavuot, Pentecost, holy day that we've discussed in the past and will undoubtedly yet have reason to discuss in the future. But now, of course, inevitably, considering that this count is ostensibly means to getting to that 50th day, it behoves us to ask, why are we counting? What's the point? And inevitably, in order to answer this question, a good way to begin is by considering altogether what counting is all about. Generally speaking, when you count something, you have a well-defined purpose. You want to get to a conclusion. You have a number of articles in front of you. You count them because you want to know how many there are. If you have a period before you, you count in order to know when you get to the end of that period. You might do a countdown, an idea that will certainly be familiar to those who remember the old days of the space age when there would always be a countdown before liftoff. In any case, usually we think of counting in that vein. And I think it's particularly instructive here for us to consider all of the other places when there is a commandment to count in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, besides this commandment to count the seven weeks, the commandment that we encounter in Leviticus chapter 23, reiterated in Deuteronomy chapter 16, there are three other contexts in which people are enjoined to count. Let's consider them at least briefly. The first two appear in Leviticus chapter 15. The context here is when people, either men or women, experience an abnormal discharge. This discharge from their body can be a source of ritual defilement. If you ask, what's the consequence of ritual defilement? Well, it certainly doesn't have any moral implications. It's not a matter of ethics. It doesn't make a person righteous or unrighteous, but it does mean that when one is in such a state of ritual defilement, one is forbidden to enter into the precincts of the holy temple or to partake of the consecrated food that comes from the offerings that are brought into the holy temple. And so 
if one experiences this discharge, there is a need to be re-entered into a state of purification. In order to re-enter that state of purification, there is a need to count, to count seven days that are entirely clean, in which there is no further discharge. So indeed, in that regard, in Leviticus chapter 15, verse 13, we read concerning the man that experiences such a discharge, he shall number to himself seven days. And likewise, in verse 28, we read the same with respect to a woman who experiences an abnormal just discharge, that after she is purified of this, she shall number to herself seven days. And after that, she shall be pure. So again, in both instances, there is a count of seven days. In both instances, at the conclusion of that period, there is a washing, and then the person, the man or the woman, is pure. The point to stress with respect to both of these commandments is there is no commandment to count. One is not fulfilling an obligation by engaging in the count. Because in truth, one is not in violation of any commandment, any prohibition that God gives us by simply remaining in a state of defilement. Again, there are places that one may not enter and things like eating consecrated food that one may not do while in a state of defilement, but there isn't any actual commandment to become purified. In that sense, it's up to the person. The count then is only means to the end. If you wish to become purified, you need to go through this count. But there isn't any commandment to count. It simply means to an end. These, I already noted, are the first two instances in which we have commandments to count. The last instance in which we have a commandment to count, something we've discussed elsewhere, is what we read in Leviticus chapter 25, in particular pertaining to the Jubilee year. In verse 8 we read, And you shall number seven Sabbaths of years unto you, seven times seven years. And there shall be unto you the days of seven Sabbaths of years, even forty-nine years. And then, of course, you make a proclamation after these 49 years are complete. And as we read in verse 10, you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And surely you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family. An interesting question, I must admit, there isn't any definitive answer to this question, is when we read in verse 8, you shall number seven Sabbaths of years unto you, is this an actual commandment? Or is it like the counts that we saw in Leviticus chapter 15, which weren't commandments per se, they were simply means to an end. Is anyone formally doing the counting with respect to the Jubilee year? could be the leaders, the court. The truth is, we're not really sure. And I suppose, at least parenthetically, I should respond to a question that many of you may be asking, and that is, well, are we doing this? Do we do this nowadays? And the response is something that I think should give us all pause, because it's awesome. In our tradition, the Jubilee year can only apply when, as we just read a few moments ago, in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10, you can proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. That means the inhabitants of the land, the nation of Israel, need to be in the land. Well, all, maybe most, but certainly requisite is at least the majority of the nation 
being in the land of Israel. And so, in our tradition, the Jubilee year was in fact observed from after the nation crosses into the land of Israel until the majority of its inhabitants are no longer there. With the beginning of the exile of the 10 tribes of Northern Israel, the Jubilee year ceased to be a practicable commandment. If you ask for how long, the answer is until this very day. We aren't speaking about something that changed with the destruction of the second temple or even with the destruction of the first temple. For roughly the last 2,700 years, we haven't been able to observe the Jubilee year because most of Israel has not been in the land of Israel. Even at the zenith of the Second Temple period, there was a plurality of the nation of Israel in the land of Israel. That is, more people than anywhere else, but not a majority. This is especially an awesome thought when one considers that within the coming decades, it is very likely that for the first time since the exile of the Ten Tribes, there will be a majority of the nation of Israel in the land of Israel. We're living through a modern miracle. But this is simply a parenthetical observation. Again, for our purposes, when we consider this third commandment with respect to counting, may it speedily be means to declaring the Jubilee year. But again, it's not so clear that there is a commandment per se to be engaged in the counting. An additional dimension that should be borne in mind with respect to all three of these other counts is a subtlety that admittedly does not carry over well in English translation. Because when we consider the three other commandments of counting, going back to Leviticus chapter 15, verse 13, and verse 28, and Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8. We, of course, will render them all into simple English as you shall number, you shall count. In Leviticus chapter 15, of course, it's in the third person, but still it's referring to counting to oneself. And what's critical to appreciate, what doesn't go over well in English, is that the verb is cast in the singular. In Hebrew, there's a different conjugation when one is speaking of an individual counting and addressing oneself to a group. In Leviticus chapter 15, again, he shall number to himself, she shall number to herself. In Leviticus chapter 25, you, singular, shall number seven Sabbaths of years. In Leviticus chapter 15, of course it's in the singular because we're speaking of an individual who, at his own volition, will count the requisite seven days in order to be purified. In Leviticus chapter 25, it is, you shall count in the singular because there manifestly is no commandment for every single member of the nation of Israel to start counting the 49 years that lead up to the 50th Jubilee year. Who counts? Well, as we noted, the leaders, the court, but certainly not everyone. This is especially striking when we consider the formulation in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15. You shall number unto you, is in the plural, in the Hebrew, usfartem lachem, not v'safartal lecha in the singular. And when we consider the implications of this conjugation, perhaps appropriating a similar illustration from later on in the chapter, in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40, when we read, and you shall take you on the first day, the four species 
on the holiday of tabernacles, just as the Hebrew in verse 15 was usfartem lachem, here in verse 40 it's ulkachtem lachem. And this indeed is the same conjugation, and it is a commandment for every single individual. We understand on tabernacles the commandment to take the four species. It would be a relatively ephemeral and abstract commandment were it not a commandment for every single individual. But why is there a commandment, again, as we saw it in verse 15, for every individual to count? If it simply means to know when we've reached the 50th day, then in exactly the same manner that we count in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8, to get to the 50th year, it would certainly be adequate if the counting was undertaken simply by the court, by the leaders, not by every individual. We're not, after all, all in the business of producing a calendar and figuring out when we are to observe the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot. So why then here is there a commandment for everyone to count? Clearly, this is a crucial question for us to answer if we're going to understand the message of this counting and how it pertains altogether to what these holy days are coming to teach us. And in trying to determine just what the count is intended to teach, I think it is especially instructive for us to consider what the significance of the numbers that we're counting here is. In particular, again, we're counting, as we saw it expressed in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 16, 50 days. What's the significance of the number 50? I'd like to share with you two different perspectives that converge, I think, on a similar conclusion. The first, deriving from a rather glaring apparent contradiction between what we read in Exodus chapter 21 and actually what we just read a few minutes ago in Leviticus chapter 25, verse 10. Of course, inevitably, whenever we encounter what appears to be a contradiction in scripture, it's a wonderful opportunity to learn something that we might not have anticipated until then. In Exodus chapter 21, we read of the servant, the bondman. In particular, what we read in verses 5 and 6 is what happens to the servant, the bondman, who does not want to go free at the end of six years as specified in verse 2. And the appropriate response is stated in verse 6. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges and shall bring him to the door or unto the doorpost and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl and he shall serve him forever. In the Hebrew, le'olam, which indeed, generally speaking, means forever. The problem is, when we consider what we read a few moments ago in Leviticus chapter 25, recall verse 10, you shall hold the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Not some, not many, all. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession. And you shall return every man unto his family. Everyone. Everyone? What about the bondman who didn't want to go free? What about the bondman? who was described as serving his master forever. The response in our tradition is, I think, particularly instructive. The Jubilee year, the 50th, is considered forever. So that when we read in Exodus chapter 21, verse 6, he shall serve him forever, that means until the Jubilee year. 
the number 50 altogether carries this connotation in Hebraic thinking of the absolute. Anything less. 49 is still within the realm of, of the finite. The 50th is forever. This obviously has implications with respect to our counting 50 days as well. But I think it's instructive for us to consider that when we speak of the count, it is presented not only as counting 50 days, we also noted that in Deuteronomy chapter 16, it is expressed as counting seven weeks. And in order to appreciate what that means, it is particularly significant for us to consider what the number seven is. Because after all, 50, need we note, is seven times seven plus one. Now, Truth be told, we have discussed the significance of the number seven at some other opportunities, but a little bit of review never hurt. In particular, as we have noted, we're very much beholden in understanding the Hebraic symbolisms of the numbers. To one of the great scholars of the 16th century, Rabbi Judah Loi Leva of the city of Prague, often known by the acronym the Maharal, one of the great Jewish thinkers of the 16th century, who besides being among our most prodigious scholars, was also an accomplished mathematician. And with respect to the number seven, he notes two perspectives that converge on one conclusion. First, consider space. How many cardinal directions are there? Four in a plane north, south, east, west, two, including up and down. So that all space can be described in terms of six directions. But six directions alone won't give you a clear definition of anything in space. In order to be able to localize anyone, anything in space, besides the six directions, you also need a reference point. You need an anchor from which to reckon distance. In short, in the language of mathematicians, you need a point of origin. Six directions, but also a point of origin. The point of origin is the seventh. It takes all the other six and makes all of them meaningful by giving him an anchor. In much the same vein, consider time. God creates everything in six days. That's what we read in Genesis chapter one. But besides the sixth, there is the seventh, the Sabbath. Also a sort of anchor in our tradition. The Sabbath is the fruit of the week and its kernel, the fruit of the week, the culmination of the six days that come before, the kernel, because it is the point of germination for the six days that come afterward. And so through the Sabbath, the seventh, the other six become meaningful. Seven then signifies completeness, completeness in space, Completeness in time. The completeness, we should note, in this world. When you take seven, time seven, the very essence of that completeness in this world, plus one. That plus one places you in the realm of transcendence. That is, of course, the 50th. It is instructive for us to consider that the manner in which God prescribes the counting in Leviticus chapter 23 verse 15 is not merely to count seven weeks but that seven weeks seven sabbaths shall there be complete seven sevens 
full completeness, the very fruition of completeness, everything as a lead up to that final dimension, seven times seven plus one, the 50th, the transcendent. So that when the 50th day comes, the Feast of Weeks, one has in some sense graduated entirely beyond everything that came before. Now, this idea, besides the numerical aspect, is something that we can also well appreciate when we consider the two offerings that are brought to the Holy Temple that bound this 50-day period on both sides. What are these offerings? Well, at the beginning of the period, we have an offering that, as we've noted, is called an Omer. But as we also noted, Omer only gives us some idea of the quantity. What type of offering is it? From what species is it brought? Tantalizingly, the Torah doesn't say. What we do see as some degree of further clarification, but still no species, is Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 9, telling us, from the time the sickle is first put to the standing corn. But what is it? Ah, well, of course, when God addressed himself to the people of Israel, entering the land of Israel, there was really no ambiguity at all. Anyone who knows the agricultural cycle of the land of Israel knows very well what species of grain would be reaped when the sickle is first put to the standing corn. The grain that ripens first in the land of Israel is barley. And in the event that we aren't living in the land of Israel and may not be so well versed in the agricultural cycle here, it could also appeal to the book of Ruth that tells us in chapter 1, verse 22, that Naomi and Ruth came to Bethlehem in the beginning of the barley harvest. And the barley harvest comes first, becomes very clear in the second chapter of Ruth, when we read in verse 23 that Ruth kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest because the wheat harvest comes second. Now, as a point of further insight into the agricultural cycle in the land of Israel, we should note further, barley was considered, for all intents and purposes, animal food, the lowest level of grain, the first grain to ripen, which is why it's the first harvest. And why, then, the Omer offering is brought exclusively from barley. And as for the offering that's brought at the end of this 50-day 50, 50 period, here we have far greater specificity. It is stated explicitly in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 17, when we are told that you are to bring two wave loaves, we'll note that the term loaves Lechen does not appear with respect to the Omer offering brought at the beginning of this period. And moreover, they shall be of solet. Solet is fine flour, specifically from wheat. That is, the word wheat is superfluous because solet necessarily refers to fine wheat flour, where wheat in the hierarchy of grains is considered the pinnacle of the grain harvest. Wheat, as opposed to barley, is for making bread for human consumption. Maybe also the reason that this meal offering is made into loaves. And finally, one additional dimension that we should stress with respect to the offering that's brought on the 50th day. As stressed again in Leviticus, Chapter 23, verse 17, they shall be baked with leaven. Uh, what about the Omer offering? Was the Omer offering brought at the beginning of this period baked with leaven? Of course, you might well respond that that's a stupid question. 
After all, the Yomer offering, recall, is brought on the morrow of the first day of Passover. There is no leaven to be found anywhere at the time. The Omer offering categorically is not leaven. But there's an additional dimension that we should also note altogether with respect to offerings that are brought in the Holy Temple. And this becomes explicit in Leviticus chapter 2 in verse 11. No meal offering which you shall bring unto God shall be made with leaven. For you shall make no leaven nor any honey go up in smoke as an offering made by fire unto God. So, normally, there is no meal offering that is leavened at all. If you ask, what about the loaves that are brought on the 50th day on the Feast of Weeks? Verse 12, as an offering of first fruits, you may bring them unto God, but they shall not come up for a sweet savor on the altar. So, as a matter of technical precision, the loaves that were brought on Shavuot, on the Feast of Weeks, were not brought upon the altar, but they were leavened, because they are considered to be an offering of first fruits. Again, recall the manner in which that offering is described in the description of Leviticus chapter 23, verse 17, is that this offering is first fruits unto God. So now consider the comparison between these two offerings. The Omer offering brought on the morrow of Passover. Barley. Practically animal food. No leaven. And there isn't any leaven to be found altogether because it's Passover. And there isn't any explicit reference to them made into lechem, loaves, because they certainly aren't made into loaves for human consumption in the same way that the loaves that are brought 50 days later are, and 50 days later, on the Feast of Weeks. Loaves, leavened, made of fine wheat flour, ideal for human consumption. What's the message here? Of course, on the one hand, it would be tempting to conclude that what the Torah is guiding us to appreciate is that you start out this process of counting, which after all begins at the moment of physical liberation from bondage on the lowest possible level. And at the end of 50 days, it would be tempting to propose that we have completely supplanted that humble starting point with a much more exalted human one. But it's, of course, important for us to remember there is no supplanting here. That first offering is indeed on a relatively initial and relatively humble physical plane. But most crucial of all, we appreciate it is indeed a starting point. And as a starting point, of course, it is particularly appropriate for its time, Passover. Passover is all about starting out. As we read in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, this month, shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Passover is all about beginnings. Likewise, in Exodus chapter 13, and truth be told, this is an idea that we find repeatedly in scripture. After emphasizing in verse three, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand, God brought you out from this place, there shall no eleven bread be eaten. In verse 4, this day you go forth in the month of spring. The month of spring is when everything is beginning. Everything is blooming. Everything is emerging from a long, cold, dark, and gloomy winter. Everything is blossoming fresh. So are you. A time of beginning, 
But what is that beginning? It is, we reiterate, the moment of physical liberation. And it's the moment at which you begin to infuse meaning into your life. You begin to infuse meaning into your life because emerging, as you just did, from bondage, from the literal bondage of Egypt, from being shackled to the rat race of trying to reach the harvest at the end of all the back-breaking effort that you expanded all winter long through the rainy season in tilling your land, in trying to coax the grain from a recalcitrant earth. After all of that, you come free. The slave doesn't have the luxury of infusing his life with meaning. His life's meaning is exactly what his master tells him his life's meaning is, nothing more. And while of course that applies to the literal slave, it applies no less to each and every one of us when we are enslaved to the struggle to get the food out of the ground, the rat race of human existence, we only begin assessing meaning when we can begin to move upward from that. And so we begin to count. Consider, for the farmer, waiting for the harvest, the beginning of the harvest, it's only natural to think he has been counting all along and striving to come precisely to this day. For the farmer, being able to get to the time the sickle is first put to the standing corn, as we expressed it in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 9, everything he's been doing the entire growing season has been to reach that milestone counting to that day. And what happens when he reaches that day? God says, okay, now you're ready to start counting. Everything until now was simply means. The real count begins here. The real count in order to learn how ultimately everything has to count. Now, of course, it's important for us to stress the offering brought at the beginning of this 50-day period is an offering. It's consecrated to God, just as the one at the end of this period. Not at all anything with which to trifle. Not anything to disdain. Moreover, we'll stress that both of these offerings are to be waived. We talked about the wave offering before, remember? Much as what we said with respect to the significance of the number seven, when you wave the offering, you're waving it in every cardinal direction. North, south, east, west, up, down. In some sense, proclaiming God's dominion over all these directions. Affirming that you are placed in this world with a mission to infuse meaning into every single one of those directions. That applies to the Omer offering as well. That doesn't end there. And indeed, then the count begins. The count from what admittedly is a humble beginning, barley, aiming to get to the wheat. And when we consider again the significance of that latter offering, not only is it wheat, it is leavened. What is the message of leavening? There, of course, many levels at which we can attempt to address that question. Obviously, we eat our bread, for the most part, leavened, and that does carry a connotation of human consumption, but maybe on an even more basic plane. What's the most important prerequisite of being able to have leavened bread? Maybe even more important than the yeast. Patience. It's not going to happen instantaneously. There's a process that needs to unfold.
a process that needs to unfold that is specifically predicated upon sevens seven times seven seven weeks seven periods each of which inculcates in you a sense of completeness of this worldly completeness because until you've gotten to that sense of this worldly completeness truth is you haven't even begun but if you think this worldly completeness is the be all and end all of your existence well you've only begun you're not there yet you need to count and what we should note in particular with respect to this count is consider we mentioned this at the outset with respect to what counting does that if it were simply means to getting to that final end point the 50th if anything we would expect that the appropriate way to count would be a countdown if all you care about is the end point you count down to the end point and i return to my illustration the way in the era of the space age we used to be glued to our screens watching the final countdown before a liftoff of the great rockets that brought human beings for the first time to the moon and the various other milestones of the age 10 9 8 7 6 5 4 3 2 1 0 liftoff we have a liftoff when you have a countdown truth is all those other numbers really don't matter the 10 and the 9, the 8 and the 7, the 6 and the 5 and the 4 and the 3 and the 2 and the 1, all you care about is getting to zero. It's only that zero, that liftoff, that matters. But the message of this count is just the opposite. It's not counting down. It's counting up. It's counting in order to learn that most important of all lessons. A lesson that you can only begin to learn with physical liberation. As you count to spiritual liberation, you learn to make everything in your life count. That, in essence, is the most crucial message of counting altogether. Again, as opposed to all the other commandments of counting that we encounter in the Torah, this one isn't in order to reach some final conclusion. If anything, on the contrary, if the goal were simply to get to Shavuot, to the Feast of Weeks, it really would be sufficient to just have the leaders or the court do the counting. Here, it's not that we count in order to get to the feast. If anything, on the contrary. Because the goal is to get to that 50th level, we need to count to ready ourselves. Because the goal is ultimately to transcend the bounds of the mere here and now, here in space, now in the present, the mere completeness of space and completeness of time in order to get to that level that goes beyond merely complete space and complete time to get to that level of transcendence, to get to that level of spirit that goes far beyond what the physical could ever possibly intimate for us. To appreciate that the end goal is not the point here. It's the process. Making every step on that journey meaningful along the way and to appreciate most crucially that every step along the way we're growing because every step along the way counts i just like by way of conclusion to share with you one additional dimension which is certainly from the perspective of jewish observance inexorable when we speak of this counting that takes place as prescribed in Leviticus chapter 23 and Deuteronomy chapter 16, even though 
there isn't any reference to it at all in the Bible. This is, in truth, a post-biblical practice, even a relatively recent one. Of recent by our standards is anything less than 2,000 years old. And that is the practice that is virtually universal in Jewish communities to observe during the period of this counting, a period of semi-mourning. Why? The reason, as anchored in a historical event, might seem to us to be so completely divorced from our contemporary reality as to be totally irrelevant. And it's important for us to appreciate why it is relevant. We need to return to the century following the destruction of the Holy Temple, the crushing of Jerusalem, and of the nation of Israel. In the year 132, Jews rebelled against the Roman Empire for a second time. They rebelled against the paganism of the Roman Empire. They rebelled against an institutionalized disregard for meaning and for God. And they held the Roman Empire at bay for approximately three years until the revolt was crushed with horrific consequences for the nation of Israel, in particular the nation of Israel here in the land of Israel. Most of all, the students of Torah, the scholars were among the spearheads of the revolt and Rome concluded that the problem with the Jews was most of all because they had this thing called the Torah that was making it so difficult to tame them and acculturate them in the ruling paganism of the empire. And so, more than anything else, they strove to stamp out the Torah by stamping out those who were studying it. The draconian laws that were enacted at the time had one goal and one goal only, to completely obliterate the Torah, and of course, to do so, to obliterate its practitioners. And so we speak of a period in which nearly all of the Torah scholars were annihilated. Of course, there are various reasons that we can discern in the literature with respect to the death of the scholars, whether it was due to disease, due to other circumstances, but what's relevant for us, I'm sure you can well appreciate, is not the immediate cause, the underlying cause. Nothing happens by accident. And the tradition that is preserved in our holy books is that the scholars were decimated because they didn't have sufficient respect for one another. Now, it's important for us to appreciate what that means. Obviously, it doesn't mean they were overtly insulting one another. It doesn't mean they were slandering one another or committing any other criminal behavior toward one another. There are far more strident ways of expressing such crimes and the relatively subtle formulation of not having sufficient respect for one another doesn't imply any of those more criminal offenses. But what does it teach us? Perhaps we could well say what it teaches us is the self-same lesson that the count was to have inculcated in us. Because when we encounter our fellow man, if we truly internalize, integrate, heart and soul, the realization that God put him here. He has a mission in this world. There is a role for him 
as for everyone and everything in this world. Ultimately, to bring the whole world back to God. And when I look at my fellow man, I see a reflection of the essence of the divine that is imprinted upon him and her, upon every single human being. Then how could I possibly not treat my fellow man with respect? If I'm not treating my fellow man with appropriate respect, evidently, I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing the essence of the divine that is imprinted upon every human being. And maybe the underlying problem, even deeper, is I'm not seeing that everything that God creates, he creates with a purpose. He creates for a reason. That everything in the world counts because God put it there. The lesson of this time of year is indeed to figure out what we're counting for and to learn that everything counts. When we fail to learn that message, disaster strikes. It doesn't have to be a disaster from outside. It's a disaster from within because something deep down is rotten. So we observe this period of warning mourning because it's important for us to continue to integrate this lesson into our lives we're not there yet but may we, we indeed well appreciate what this count is all about it does indeed start with the simplest of thresholds physical liberation not, of course, because physical liberation is inconsequential. On the contrary, it's the starting point, the point from which we embark, from which we start bringing an offering to God, even if that offering in the interim is still animal food. But it's a wave offering because we are seeking meaning, completeness everywhere around us. It doesn't end there. As we do so, we begin to count. We learn to make everything count. We drive that message of meaning and significance into everything that takes place around us. We recognize that it isn't simply a matter of reaching a goal, it's the process, which is why we need to count day after day to reach that level of completeness in space and completeness of time, but to go beyond that, to reach the level of the 50th. Of course, inevitably, I couldn't possibly conclude this session without noting, as we've noted in the past, that while on the one hand, there is absolutely no date stated anywhere in the Bible for the revelation at Sinai. On the other hand, our tradition tells us the revelation at Sinai took place after these 50 days of counting. Because ultimately, after all, that's the message. When we integrate what this is all about, when we appreciate what it means to infuse meaning and significance into everything that we're doing, we ready ourselves to receive God's teaching, the Torah. We ready ourselves to infuse meaning and significance into everything which is precisely what the Torah's message is all about. And by so doing, ironically, we become that much more integrated with everything in the world around us. Seven times seven, and we also become transcendent, going beyond it all. Seven times seven plus one, because everything becomes means to an end that transcends it. And again, the patience, the leaven, the culmination of a process. Because all this time, we haven't merely been counting days. We have been learning over and over and over again how to make every single day 
count the greatest blessing. God bless you.